Um, uh, hello everyone, my name is Angelica Basquera from the SOA Center of African Studies, and I'm very pleased to welcome everyone tonight to uh, our Artist Talk series. Uh, it's a series of events that has been running for a number of years at the Center of African Studies in collaboration with the SOA School of Art. Uh, today in particular, we are collaborating uh, with the Gallery 1957. Um, gallery 1957 is a gallery that um, was uh, founded and is based in, in Accra, in Ghana, uh, but now has a London uh, outpost that opened in 2020. Uh, the gallery has a curatorial focus on West Africa and presenting a program of exhibition, installation and performances by the region most significant artists. Um, and one of them uh, is uh, Yao Obusu, uh, that we are very, very uh, pleased and honored to welcome uh, today uh, to uh, talk with us uh, in our series. Um, Yao creates culture installation that the repurposed found object shifted the value of otherwise worthless material into things of beauty. Uh, built from countless pieces of loose change known as Peseva coins, his work activates urgent questions around economic and political independence in contemporary Ghana. Uh, he, first uh, he first introduced as an attempt to cure the country economic inflation in 2007. Uh, this small copper coin have almost no value in today's financial climate, enabling the artist to use them as his primary material. Um, so this is like a very brief uh, sort of a snapshot, uh, but uh, we will hear uh, more uh, now uh, directly from Yao. And we are very, very um, grateful uh, to our uh, colleague, um, uh, Dr. David Malik from the SOA School of Art, who has kindly agreed uh, to chair the, con the discussion today and to engage with uh, uh, Owusu's work. Um, and I'll now uh, pass it on to uh, David to take over uh, the conversation uh, with, uh, with Yao. Thank you very much and welcome everyone. Thank you very much, Angelica. Welcome everyone again. Uh, I'm very happy to be invited to participate and to speak with such an exciting artist, uh, Yao Wusu. Uh, I, will, uh, I will just go very briefly about the structure. We kind of uh, decided how we're gonna go about it today. So for whoever you just joined at the moment, we will uh, we will be decided with you all, we will kind of uh, structure it around three key themes, so uh, key, uh, key subjects. Uh, the first one, we will look at the early stages of uh, Yao's uh, art practice or his personal and artistic trajectory in Ghana. Uh, we will perhaps touch upon this uh, formal and informal forms of training, apprenticeship, and uh, most likely his inspiration as a kind of as an emerging artist in Ghana. So that's the first stage, and then we will move to his uh, his current art practice. Uh, he's located in New York, so we will look at his uh, his work there, and mainly we will discuss his recent collaboration with the gallery. 1957 as Angelica highlighted just now and we will use this talk to invite you and to encourage you to come and visit the gallery here in London. Uh, I believe that next week uh, Yao is organizing in cooperation with the gallery it's kind of artist walkthrough so we will discuss that. We will look at the materials uh, Yao is using, the techniques and most importantly is kind of conceptual ideas behind this uh, beautiful, uh, beautiful work. And then at the third topic, or we'll close up with uh, with discussion about his ambitions towards future. We will look at what's ahead, which kind of projects are ahead, his ambitions and so on and so forth. So this will take for about uh, 40 minutes. In the meanwhile, throughout the discussion, Yao will be sharing images uh, visuals of his, uh, his previous installations and throughout that I would encourage you to please engage participate uh, write your questions in that if you look at your zoom on the bottom there's little Q&A so you can write your questions there or you can write it in that in a chat which is also on that on that kind of bottom link I'll take notes throughout the talk and then uh, once we finish the discussion between me and Yao we're going to give 
space to your questions and that would last for maybe another 40, 30, 40 minutes and we will wrap up around 6.15, uh, So should we start, Yo? Welcome again. Great to you are. Would you like uh, to say a few words before we start? Yeah, I mean, first off, I would love to uh, thank the School of uh, Oriental and African Studies and, you know, the Center of African Studies for organizing this in conjunction with the gallery, uh, Angelica, and then also to thank you for also, you know, chairing this uh, very important kind of discussion for me uh, about the work. Um, and I'm privileged also to the audience for joining. I'm privileged to have the opportunity to share my work uh, and my practice to them. Um, so yeah, I'm excited about this and I, I look forward to what we talk about now. Excellent, fantastic. Thank you very much. So should we, should we start with uh, perhaps yeah. your artistic uh, kind of upbringing, artistic trajectory in Ghana? If you'd be so kind, perhaps discuss your uh, both formal and informal forms of training, apprenticeship, what was the inspiration behind and kind of the beginnings of your art practice? Um, well, uh, maybe I'll, I'll share some images and uh, so we yeah, guys are here. Um, but uh, um, really I started, uh, I schooled in, uh, let me see, let me go back to this. So I grew up in Ghana, I was born and raised there. Um, and my parents, my parent, my dad was a teacher. So I grew up in this archive where he had collections of books and most importantly, like news articles, newspapers from up, around the world. Uh, and in this, in this sort of archival room, that's where I used to paint, uh, you know, painting from uh, Western influences, you know, seeing the most uh, masterpieces and things like that, and also painting things and scenes that I would see around as a young kid. Um, and I loved that, I mean, even though I didn't know what uh, that made me an artist, because I didn't understand that at the time. But I studied in high school where I did uh, picture making, uh, textiles, and uh, also chemistry, which is pretty much like painting in itself. Um, and then uh, after high school, I went to Cairn University, University, and then I studied painting and sculpture. Um, there. So uh, for the you know, early ages, I was painting and I was, I, I, I was used to that, that aspect of uh, art and also studied painting in, in Cairn University. But in my final years, uh, I think I got, I got a little bored with a, with a, with a you know, traditional technique of painting because I didn't have any subject matter to it. And then uh, on one journey, when I was working with pinhole cameras, I went to the beach in the south uh, coast of, you know, go, uh, Cape Coast of Ghana. And there, uh, when I came back, I realized that the, you know, copper pesos, you know, the one pesos that I had in my pocket had changed um, into like these beautiful textures and colors. And, and then I think that was the time that I realized, oh, that could be a very interesting object to paint with. Um, so I started making kind of compositions with that until I started, you know, also investigating into where it was made, what it was made of, you know, these things opened it all up uh, to me, identifying that, oh, actually it was made by the Royal Canadian Mint. And like I said, I grew up around my dad's political articles and these kind of political contest. So uh, everything about my work was tied, you know, to that political relevance. And I became interested in questioning economies with that. Um, so this is a close up of, you know, one of the earlier pieces that I did. But then also, uh, I started studying maps, uh, I started studying, you know, the origins of commodities. And the, this is like an early 1930 or so uh, map from Gold Coast. And it's, it's uh, pretty much a railway kind of line um, where you know, the railway system was built or generated around where commodities are in Ghana you know, to be exported you know, during the Gold Coast era or during the colonialism, colonization era. Um, so I became 
came, I began making forms and works that mimic these sort of maps uh, and these for sort of um, places of commodities or objects of value. And, and these installations all made of the pestwares with that uh, kind of knowledge of oxidation, like I said, uh, I had just identified that the, the PESWA would just react to anything. So I started pushing that idea of generating color, generating texture uh, with, with, with the, with the PESWA, and then I would paint with that. Um, I also became interested in, uh, in form. Uh, I became interested in the economic and you know, political structure of Ghana how you know even uh, uh, finances and, and social status had demarcated societies uh, depending on who lives where you know and I think it's a global phenomenon but I was mostly interested in the Ghanaian uh, aspects of it uh, you know when during my, my university time so I started making forms like this that were actually kind of uh, you know interrogating structural uh, forms architectural you know uh, you know, architectures and things like that. And space uh, also became really relevant for me. Um, and then I moved on also to taking the works outside because uh, I realized that I was almost getting stuck into that idea or that traditional sense of painting where the work had to like, you know, lay flat or, you know, hang on a wall or, you know, it needed to be seen in that kind of vertical uh, posture. And I had this opportunity to work at a railway station that wasn't working. And then I think the interest became uh, about non-functional systems uh, with an, a non-functional uh, currency. So I made this, these like almost uh, uh, kind of vis invisible or like non-functional columns that run around like it, it dropped uh, draped around uh, the walls of these uh, this kind of um, collapsed railway station and I was interrogating uh, the systems of power at the time the Ghanaian government in terms of economics in terms of distribution of wealth or uh, assets and in this kind of infrastructural deficits in, in the country at the time um, and, and these are like uh, from, you know, people also coming to pick up. So then when I took the works out, I didn't realize that it was reacting to space, it was reacting to people. And that I think also led me to be interested in, in space, you know, consider space as a very important object uh, in my work. And then in 2017, uh, I think uh, I, I had this, uh, opportunity to also exhibit at uh, a Telewater Art Festival, which, which happens in Jamestown. And when I had the space kind of designated for me, uh, it was at the Asha Fort. Now the Asha Fort is a, 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 a previous colonial kind of uh, slave prison. And I had this pretty much short time frame and it's a festival, so people, I believe my thoughts was that people wouldn't have the chance to like uh, stay or stand for minutes to grasp kind of abstracts of um, works like the ones that I was doing. So I went straight to uh, kind of bring in an object or an image that people could relate to. So I made this almost, I think, 15 by 24 feet uh, wide flag, all cladded in the, in the pestles. And ironically, the, the, the area that this festival happens, which is Jamestown, uh, is one of the most impoverished, maybe, excuse me for my uh, lack of vocabulary, but impoverished neighborhoods. So when I had the work there and imagine people coming to see uh, the flag cladded in, in, in money, I mean, in my mind, I wasn't considering all of these, but then it became people started taking the money from, from the flag uh, because, I mean, for whatever reason, but they had seen money that had been left there. I think not until a few, maybe years after the work and me understanding what actually happened, that's when I really got to understand that, oh, the work wasn't about the flag. It wasn't about, you know, the beauty of the, the, the object that I created 
but it was about the interaction uh, with the people, with the space and the context that had placed uh, the work into. So in a video like this, you see the kids coming uh, and picking, liberally beating the flag to pick out coins. Uh, and I felt that was a very powerful thing uh, that, had, that could happen to any art work in this film uh, in a way that I didn't have to force a narrative onto it. It was just happening in this sense. And uh, you could see the reality of the situation that I had been kind of uh, interrogating. Um, yeah, so I think these are some of the thoughts that I was working with when I was in Ghana, you know, through my uni age, uh, days and uh, also a few years after I graduated. Mm. Uh, yeah. Um, mm. yeah. No, that's, uh, that's absolutely fascinating. Thank you very much for sharing these uh, beautiful images. I found particularly the flag you created, uh, yeah. incredible project because as you have highlighted, uh, the work is kind of not finished uh, the moment uh, you have laid your last coin, but the process still continues as the communities kind of participate on that uh, on that second life of that object. That's that's beautiful. That's wonderful. And uh, uh, I would like to just uh, follow up on something you have mentioned. Yeah, yes. I found very interesting. Uh, uh, looking at that flag, uh, kind of thinking about the material, uh, looking at the materiality of that and of the and, and the process making of that uh, one it kind of brings me brings to my mind is kind of the, the notion of the western approaches to african visual culture have been quite, until quite recently separate kind of separated this uh, the long standing art traditions uh, from modern as if these two categories had no common ground as if uh, only the former was authentically african however uh, Atakwami, in his book uh, African Modernism, he quite nicely demonstrated that tradition is also a kind of active process of handing on a subject of evolution, development, and the history. And I would like to ask you, kind of, what is your approach as an artist to some of the rich art traditions of Ghana, uh, uh, textile making? Uh, bronze casting, whatever, whatever influenced you, whatever you think uh, informed you as an artist. Um, well, that's a, that's that's a beautiful point you, wrote, you raised there. Uh, I think in Atapamis, uh, you know, uh, even Kumasi, you know, realism, you know, you see he he was basically just documenting daily life, you know, daily objects, and these are things that. Growing up, you see, you know, you see people hand painting signs and billboards and things like that. So the technique of painting, you know, doesn't really. I didn't have to learn outside Ghana. Uh, the cho choice of color in Ashanti, I'm an, I'm an Ashanti, so the choice of color in the kente and even meaning attached to these kind of textiles and 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 how you even wear it when you wear it. Like these are things that. Basically, it's it's not surreal to the to the West African contest or even to the African contest. Um, of course, maybe it was uh, not documented, or maybe perhaps it wasn't projected as uh, the Western canon would have been projected. But uh, like uh, in up north, the women painting like these are things that it, it's like a daily activity. It wasn't taught by from a, uh, maybe an outside lens, but we were living this. So I think uh, even in my work, um, it's, uh, I, I, I do not need a chemical kind of a process. These are things that I, I, I self-taught myself um, because when I, maybe one point is when I was, I was a kid, I used to paint with everything. You know, I would paint with shoe polishes I would paint with toothpaste, you know, anything that could give me color instead of like acrylic or oils. So you then become used to your, your own kind of form or own way of making or creating an image or a picture or a painting or even a sculpture. So we, I think I grew up knowing uh, the diverse use or the multiplicity of, of materials. And even though some of them are domestic, as we would use, uh, they are contextually uh, on a global art kind of context, very valid and very viable, you know, to use as art objects. 
Um, so it made me feel comfortable to use uh, a pennies because all the pest was, because then it was generating a, an extra layer of painting. You know, I am now making my own. I never use paint in my studio. Maybe the only paint I use is to paint some backgrounds black, <laughs> of course, but otherwise all the pe pest was or pennies are, the colors and textures are generated without, without paint. Uh, mm, in a mm. natural or, or, or artificial, it's, I mean, you could describe that as playful alchemy, but it's also purely chemistry if uh, we were to like write equations to back that. Mm, mm. Yeah. Excellent. Well, thank you very much for that, uh, from painting uh, your, your background, your uh, your artistic uh, trajectory from Ghana, and that kind of that moves us smoothly to your current projects, to your current exhibition in, in, in London, and but also towards your life as an artist, as a, as a person in New York. Uh, would you be so kind and, and coming on that? And perhaps we can, through your discussion and uh, showing the objects and images, uh, maybe we can invite the audiences to visit uh, the current exhibition in the gallery. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, maybe uh, also, you know, when I, I moved to New York, uh, I think it added another extra layer. Uh, David, you know, uh, you know, started seeing these objects, these like beautiful sculptures that are stuck to the ground, uh, documenting them as photos or even lost objects. Uh, the idea of space, the idea of decay, <laughs> especially in New York and, you know, the disgust of it, but also the beauty that comes with it. Um, now smell, of course, you know, people who are familiar with New York would know, you know, the stench and dirt. Uh, these are things that I started to be very aware of and, you know, and I employed in my work. I think the space when I moved to New York started also opening up another layer into my work and then uh, and also allowed me to, to go outside. Uh, and now going outside meant that I, I wasn't making sculptures anymore. I was making conversations, which was in other sense, like creating an extra uh, or another form of artwork. So I did this uh, kind of, um, you know, performance, pretty much like a you know, performative piece where I was asking people around New York with this postcard, what they would do for a penny. And that was due to the fact that um, New York had raised the minimum wage to $15, I believe. And uh, uh, I wanted to know who was working so low to be getting $15 an hour and who you know, was paid. So that idea of uh, exchange of value for labor then became very interesting. So I started this and, you know, going to like train stations that were crowded, you know, people were changing trains, uh, you know, so time also became a very good factor in my work, uh, going to like uh, people, places where it was leisure, like parks, Central Park, uh, and then like Times Square, you know, where places where time functioned almost differently. And I'll ask them and they will fill out and I pay them actually, or I compensate them with a penny. So in a sense, we were exchanging like artworks, conversations that were almost extremely valuable. And as much as also exchanging, uh, 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 I'm paying them. So that sense of uh, value exchange became an interesting point. But through that uh, project, I realized that I'll take like a hundred cards out and maybe get 15 responses in a day. Um, and I was comfortable with that because I had many and I was doing it. But then I realized that I, I was, I had my backpack at my back and I would dip my hand into my backpack and pull out the cards to strangers. Um, I mean, I'm from Ghana. So, you know, that act isn't really anything special. It is not anything of threat. But then I realized uh, how, how dangerous, you know, as a, an African, you know, black man to be pulling or digging my hand into a, a bag that nobody knows what it's in and you know towards a stranger um so when i showed this project to a few people you know presentations then the question became like didn't you know this was something very dangerous you know because people had been shot over over toy cell phones mm. over you know, mm. just having their hands in their pockets 
So then myself as a person became a big question because then if it was any other, maybe it wasn't a big question, but me as a black person doing this became uh, a valuable kind of uh, point, you know, to, to kind of address. So I started mm. making these objects. And also at the time in 2019 was when uh, the ICE was uh, arresting illegal immigrants, you know, trying to get people out. Uh, and then I'm on a student visa at the time, uh, but people thought that I was in danger. Uh, so that idea of being in between spaces, uh, being an outsider, led me to create these sculptures that almost felt like you were trapped between spaces. Mm. Uh, the idea of the emergency blanket that was being used at the borders for like people, separation of families, separation of people from you know their purposes and all of that. So I started incorporating these objects. I started incorporating my fences, uh, like walls. Um, so the idea of uh, 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 symbolisms or symbols like that American flag, what it stood for against what uh, the American government at the time was doing or, you know, um, so that also introduced me to a more kind of American independence because on the, on the, on the penny that I started using, it's repeated liberty ever since it was made. Uh, at least since 1905, it has liberty, in God we trust, and Lincoln said. So these symbols and images, you know, considering Lincoln as a person of emancipation, uh, and, you know, fast forward 2019, people still being almost incarcerated or under oppression, then became a relevant object for me to like, use as a question. And what independence means, what liberty means, uh, and, and I think it was, it was, it was, it worked well because in Ghana, our money is made by the Royal Canadian Mint, the same people who colonized us. And in the U S, uh, I mean, it's written liberty and, you know, you are emancipated, but, you know, black societies or the black people didn't have that equal right to exist in, in, in so many fronts. So then I became interested in questioning that. Mm, uh, mm. And even this piece that uh, in 2020 during the pandemic, which I, I joined in a lot of the protests for Black Lives Matter, because that was what I had to do. I was in New York and we were on the street and then the whole US were actually fighting this. And then I, I found a 1920 penny uh, and then, you know, researching into it, realized that, you know, Marcus Gavi had created a, uh, a flag for the black folk, uh, but now in 1920, he was fighting the same battle. In 1980, you know, uh, David Hammonds has created, had created this flag for the independence of the black Americans. And in 2020, we were fighting the same battle. Um, so I thought it would be an interesting composition to pick up this object of liberation uh, and then really kind of amplify what it stood for in the map form. Um, mm. Yeah, so the, the work started becoming like that. And later last year, I mean, when it was locked down, uh, I needed panels to work on, uh, but there are, the shops are closed, you know, there is no transportation of objects, you know, all these kind of debates. And I, uh, so this is a video, but I'll talk whilst it plays. So I was taken out, the coins from a work that I've done that I learned first to make another piece. Uh, chiseled out the, the pennies, and I realized, uh, I mean, I was reading about Torres, I was reading about Greenwood, and then I realized that it was the same thing. It felt like the same kind of visuals. Uh, thing that had happened to the Black Wall Street in Tulsa in 1921. Uh, so the work then became like a memory lost. You know, so these, the gray areas, uh, like I removed uh, pennies, but I still have the marks of the penny and, and you know, all the indications and text. Um, mm. The idea of memory, the idea of enduring economy, so I became interested. And that's when I finished the piece, is when it, it opened up for this show. Uh, me to question uh, the economy and the uh, contribution of black people uh, in, uh, 
in, in America or even through the transatlantic uh, to America and then mm. tie it back to London. It's like drawing a real triangle from you know, uh, some of the people, stakeholders through the slave trade, to slavery, uh, to the formation of the new world, which was done then America and then back to the same place that uh, or the same people that initiated that or some of the same people that initiated that. Mm, mm. Well, that, that is that is very interesting. I think uh, link you just uh, draw because throughout your work, I can see that you are very much interested in kind of in the value through materials and kind of the shifting values of these found objects, which then you later transform into works of art. And uh, you kind of, I can see that you actively research this transformation of these subjects into the value. And in our conversation, you mentioned the labor, what's kind of involved into this, uh, into this magical transformation in order to create the subject and also the kind of the idea of object as commodities. And you linked it with the transatlantic slave trade when uh, some, when obviously people were transported as a commodity. So would you, would you maybe perhaps elaborate uh, a little bit on that? Yeah, uh, I mean, you know, thanks for the question, David. I, I think um, uh, the idea of the formation of the new world uh, meant that, you know, uh, industries or, you know, needed to be formed, you know, houses needed to be built, railroads, ro uh, railroad roads needed to be, to be made. And that need for labor really contributed to that mass kind of uh, 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 distraction by importing humans as objects, mm. uh, you know, or as machines, as you would import like a crane or, you know, articulate or something to, to, to farm. So I think that need for labor, you know, easily placed uh, West Africans and most Africans as objects and it was traded. Now, when they ended up in the new world, or also, as you know, they became like functional objects that people were buying them for their strength. Mm. Uh, it's, it feels kind of weird me using these terms for people or humans, but that was the scenario of uh, how the, the, the discovery or like uh, uh, the place as an object now required another form of object to make it function. Mm. Uh, and then those objects then became human. And in the same way, I kind of feel like me transforming the, the least uh, or like as an individual, because I consider the Pessoa or the Penny as an individual, like we are a single beings uh, uh, and same as the pes Penny. You can't go below the Penny uh, as a physical tangible object, um, but that need for objects, that need for labor, that it became, mm. it then turned mm. us into that form. And then we were traded on courts uh, in Wall Street, uh, on, you know, on these, at these kind of specific places that in markets, uh, people were auctioned as objects. Mm. And uh, that I think that phenomenon kind of informs my, 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 uh, research into value because mm. then how then does an object turns from one to the other uh ironically the penny and the peswa the peswa for instance is made of steel and it's uh plated with copper uh the penny is made of zinc and it's plated with uh, copper but it's like 97.5 percent zinc and 2.5 percent copper but when you take the object it looks like it's pure copper um, so almost like taking an object to look like another uh, is interesting. Then it became it, it, it kind of accumulates value or even generates value. Mm. Like you know, <laughs> in my work, like you know, you see red pennies, you see gold pennies, you see black, blue, like almost every color, and then it becomes another object that finds sense. Uh, quite differently. <laughs> yes, yes. Well, that's uh, that's great that you brought this up. Thank you for the, the very nice conceptual explanation of your thought process. And uh, I would like to, if we can, before we invite people to the gallery and perhaps we can uh, discuss this current exhibition in the gallery 1957 in London, if we can please, uh, just for very br uh, briefly, if you 
don't mind, discuss your your process. How do you work with these coins? How do you work with these uh, with these tokens? I know that you work with the salt water and different uh, different liquids. Would you be kind and elaborate on that? Um, yeah. Uh, so initially, when I I I, I found an encounter with the sea water, that was an opener. Uh, but then, because I was this, I was talking about economy. I was talking about exchange and circulation. In Ghana, I was using, I would use like vinegar, uh, and then I was tying it to to like uh, the eastern regions and middle uh, kind of parts of Ghana where agriculture is more, you know, uh, uh, it's more, more more the most economic activity, uh, and you know you could use like. So things that were found at places is what I was using. Um, so I used like elements, I used like humidity, you know, sunlight. I, I try to use all natural objects or natural elements that if I do not initiate this reaction, maybe over years, it will, it will end up that way. Um, <laughs> yeah, so so then I think it, it, will, it will feel quite artificial if I was I had a lab and I was like, okay, this is like sodium chloride, let's put it into like ammonium and then create this kind of artificial coloring. I think that would take out my heart from it. But these are very, very, very common objects that everyday objects that we use under everyday conditions to generate these colors. Uh, and some are potentially like could potentially morph into other things, you know, mm. if it goes to other uh, uh, conditions as well. So you have like colors and textures like these that are, uh, I mean, it's hard to describe, but then it, it happened under very, very common uh, conditions. And I use steel as well. So, you know, it's, these are, I believe, like a reference, uh, industrialization, a reference capitalism, a reference building nations, you know, and uh, uh, what I do is I treat steel, which seems very robust, as, like, as paper or as fabric that you can weave, you can cut, uh, you can lay them over um, in layers and layers. So, you know, something like capitalism that seems almost like extremely robust becomes something very light and very loose mm. that can be restructured uh, or like remade uh, to fit human needs. Um, so these are things that I think about when I'm working, you know, of course, you know, architectural and city designs, uh, um, kind of classism and things like that, that almost like demarcations inform the bodies. Uh, mm, mm. And I mean, sometimes I also experiment with complex forms that I cannot describe, but the idea that I can, I can actually use the steel or the penny anyhow I want, uh, <laughs> it's, it's really interesting mm, mm. oh that's uh, that's very very uh, interesting well should we use this as uh, our bridge to invite people to your current exhibition in london and perhaps if you'd be so kind and share a few words what are you showing where is it and how long is it going to be for and perhaps we can also invite people for the next week artist all because I believe that the explanation and discussion with an artist in front of uh, his work is uh, the best as it gets, I think. Yeah, <laughs> yeah uh, I mean, uh, the work, uh, as I mentioned, has been, has been a year in the making. Uh, so a lot of efforts and a lot of hands has gone through it. Um, uh, the, the show, we, we are having a walk through next week, next week, Thursday, where, um, of course, mine, is something you need to see so you can experience uh, the depth of it and even the aesthetics of it. And it's happening in the gallery 1907 in Kazanstin, uh, Kazanstin um, or One Hyde Park Gates. So yeah, I invite everybody to come. Let's have discussions. If you have like extra questions, uh, whilst we engage with the works physically, I would love to answer any questions or also learn from you as much as possible. Um, yeah, so this is like a very big invitation to everybody. Uh, come, let's discuss about the work and see it uh, and tell me what you think. Tell me what history I need to know, because I would love to learn from people as much as I can. Excellent, excellent. I had uh, uh, the privilege to visit uh, a couple of weeks ago. I very much enjoyed it. It's a beautiful space, beautiful artwork. 
And that brings me to another question. I know that, uh, for example, I, uh, we, uh, we're going to stay from uh, uh, comparisons, but I know that, uh, for example, Al Natsui's work, right. he let uh, the curators, he let the institution and uh, our private investors to display his work as they please, so they can fold it in ways they 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 find interesting do you instruct uh, curators in because i saw that uh, not all of your work is flat some of it is flowing like textiles as well do you enclose uh, instructions do you enclose the videos or do you let their kind of uh, uh, kind of artistic endeavor and inspiration or or, or or moments of madness to to intervene with your work I mean, uh, most of the work is made by accident, oh, like unconventional uh, means. So there's that freedom to, to make changes while we install. Uh, also because the work, my work uh, kind of interacts with space completely different. Mm. At the studio, I have one thing and in the gallery or uh, any other space, it functions different depending on how the, the place is. So mm. I, once I make it, or I try to make it, the work then starts making itself by mm. how it lives. So, I mean, I could only have a limited control for it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because the lighting uh, is different, the encounters are different, the spaces also are different. So there's that room for people to like almost make changes. Uh, mm. Mm. Yeah. And, Oh, that's that's brilliant. That's brilliant. Thank you. Well, I hope that we will see lots of people there next week. Uh, and uh, before we give space uh, to our audience to ask uh, questions or share their ideas and their comments, maybe we can move to our last chapter of our talk. Uh, this is the this is uh, before I start. This is one of the beautiful foldy uh, work. Uh, very kind of plastic, very textile like. It's a, a beautiful kind of transition of a material. I find it. I find it very interesting. It's a beautiful work. Uh, uh, so, uh, would you be uh, so kind, yo, know, and perhaps share uh, what what's in what's ahead? What's the future? Uh, I know that we can't predict, but hopefully, perhaps we sh maybe have some plans, maybe some ambitions where we want to exhibit, and so on and so forth. What's what's ahead for you? Um, I mean. Uh... <laughs> After this, this uh, uh, show that I think the future is almost limitless. Uh, I mean, I have so much creative energy now to take whatever risk that I want to. And uh, like I said, I, I've, I'm enjoying the work living outside like controlled spaces. Mm. Uh, so uh, I've started some sort of um, outdoor field works that I'm pushing that idea with materials and how it reacts to space and environments. So that's one big project that I'm working on now. Uh, also working towards a bigger collaboration with other artists that uh, we could potentially make works together, uh, potentially learn by you know just sharing each other's kind of processes. Mm -hmm. So that's I think that's the that's the future now. Like. Uh, uh, erasing boundaries between uh, the artist genius and, and collaborations. Mm. Uh, that's how I want to go. Uh, so there'll be a number of collaborations with uh, established and artists like myself. Um, yeah, to, to build and to learn from each other. I don't know what we can create. It could be a writing, it could be uh, some other form that, that can come out of this, but of course, uh, as I'm working with the Gallery 97, there are a lineup of other shows and projects that, you know, I wouldn't talk about them now, but that people will get to be surprised when they happen. Yeah, but more ambitious, uh, more, yeah, ambitious projects. And yeah, there is no limits from here. Mm -hmm. That's excellent. We perhaps forget to mention that the Gallery 1957, they have uh, bought a gallery here in London and a very beautiful place close to Hyde Park, as well as a gallery space in Ghana in Accra. So whoever's yeah. traveling West Africa, perhaps good point to, uh, to visit. Yeah. Uh, is there anything else we should add before we give uh, space to our audiences for any questions? Um, I mean, aside, uh, the show is up until, yeah, end of next week maybe extended but yeah you know i look forward to welcoming everybody and also your questions if anybody has one 
Excellent. Is there anyone from the audience who would like to ask a question? We can do it either through the video or you can do it through uh, putting a question on your in the chat or perhaps uh, in your Q&A. Give one minute, perhaps 30 seconds before people can formulate it or write it down. Uh, uh, before we do that, Ayo, uh, can I ask you, as you have oh. mentioned that you are very interested, you are very interested in the value and kind of also in the, uh, perhaps you can call it the macroeconomics of Ghana and how young generations suffers perhaps from the mistakes of uh, what has been done in the past. I know that we discussed this very briefly in our private conversation, but how do you see, uh, for example, the future of uh, of the cryptocurrencies and kind of uh, how this could open up opportunities, if ever, to younger generation to participate on uh, global markets, on global events, and uh, being uh, truly kind of involved in the in the you know international flows of money, goods, services, and so on and so forth. Um, uh, so I think Ghana now has become almost like a hub. <laughs> For, for arts especially, uh, it's a growing economy. Mm. So there's, I think initially maybe a decade or two ago where you know, we needed to reach uh, the West uh, for economic kind of uh, exchanges. Now it's more the opposite. Mm. Um, so uh, there are lots of artists in Ghana who have like more Western or even outside collectors now than ever. Uh, and they are buying from from Ghana, like especially mm. also is in Ghana, and it has uh, numerous clients. Uh, in terms of like uh, the digital currency space, of course, there is there's still that uh, limitation because of the use of credit cards. Ghana's economy doesn't support credit card users, so uh, opening accounts and online kind of platforms becomes a barrier. Mm. But, uh, there are there are ways that. Uh, people are still navigating that and creating like uh, multiple forms of of uh, reaching these kind of e e economies. Mm, um, mm. So it's exciting. It's really it's exciting. Now Twitter is in Ghana, so also the tech uh, is is going. You know, it's coming to to there, and it's almost like a flat land now. Uh, yeah, where, yeah. Yeah. So it's and exciting, really. Um, uh, mm. One artist that I know, uh, Nana Dan, so recently um, launched uh, an, an NFT and it looks like he's doing amazing. So there is that uh, possibility of growth. Uh, into, mm. yeah. That's what I wanted to ask you. I know that uh, for you, perhaps the materials and how do materials interact uh, with uh, you know members of uh, broader communities and how also the decay plays in the in the visuality of your objects and the plasticity and all that. But would you be, do you see yourself being invested into non-fungible tokens, NFTs, making your art, your 3D art into, you know, into NFTs? I mean, I, I'll i be wrong to say yes or no, but because, I mean, I, I do not completely understand the NFTs now. Of course, I need a lot of work to be done. Um, but yeah, I think there are aspects, if not, my work as sculptures or mm. uh, existing as uh, 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 NFTs, but there are numerous aspects that could exist uh, and that I would experiment with pretty soon, maybe next year. So there are mm. aspects of work, like the documentation of even the, the reactions that could mm. be as videos, that mm. could be as photos, uh, in that sense, could potentially be. But like I said, uh, I still need to understand the NFT, NFT's world and uh, um, better, you know, to get my foot into it. Mm, um, mm, yeah. mm. And thank you very much for that. Um, just to open up another chapter, perhaps before uh, people uh, gonna put any questions up. Uh, how about uh, are you? Is your work represented by any uh, institutions uh, in uh, in the, on the African continent or in the West? Or is it perhaps a space for the future where to get get involved? Or how do you see that? Is it important for you? <laughs> yeah, I think I think I would love uh, for the for as many people to interact and uh, engage with the work as much as possible. Um, I mean, I wouldn't love that these only end in homes, which is mm. beautiful. 
but then it gets to leave in places where there are dialogues, uh, it gets written about, it, it has like conversations around. And I mean, over the past two, the gallery, I've had a few institutions that, you know, uh, like the Macau in Morocco has a peace of mind. So it leaves the, uh, uh, the Shiloh Museum in, in Nigeria. Also, you know, the work leaves there and a, a couple of other institutions. I, in this summer, I, I completed uh, a permanent installation with Facebook through their open arts commissions. So these are things that expands the reach mm. of my, uh, you know, mm. for them to live in other spaces that, one, I mean, sometimes I might not even get a chance to be there to in interpret or explain the work, but people would find ways to also engage in different forms. Mm. Yeah, I, 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 I mean, it would be a privilege to have my works in museums as many as possible. Uh, and I look forward to that. I know it will happen to some patients uh, for that, but mm. uh, I think it will be a beautiful thing when people can have conversations and engage with the work. So. Mm. Uh, yeah, I look forward to that happening. <laughs> but it is happening. <laughs> but I'm sure you're still very young, so I'm sure that it's uh, it's already happening. It will happen a bit more. I'm yeah. sure. So it is a lot about exposure to the work, isn't it? Uh, it it's a lot yeah. about kind of how many audiences, what the number of people can actually see it and interact with it. It's quite an interesting point you made about your kind of offering an explanation or uh, some kind of suggestions what's behind the work, what does it represent? How do you see that it may represent very different thing? It may gonna be interpreted very different thing, very differently by different audiences, by, by diff different people. Are you happy about that? Are you, do you see it as a restriction or do you see it as a, as a beneficial? Uh, <laughs> I mean, uh, now the, like some pennies, of course, I'm holding pennies that age uh, maybe centuries before I was born. Uh, so the objects have already outlived me. It means that I, there is no way I can be the only one to explain the work that has mm. been made. Uh, I love, there are instances that um, I've had people, I remember a, a number of years ago when I showed a flag, I, I was standing by it and then I saw a, a lady explain, an old lady explain the work that I have made to her grand, grandchild but I had never even, I thought she was more brilliant than I am. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> yeah, than I am. And I've had instances like that where people open up uh, like areas that I have even not considered, but because, yeah, I can only know much mm. to keep up. But <laughs> yeah. That's brilliant. Yeah. That's brilliant. So yeah. even artists can learn about his own or her, his or her own work through the eyes and mouths of the audiences. That's brilliant. <laughs> yeah, yeah, really. That's great. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, we have two questions. I mean, if I, if you may start with the first one. So the question is, uh, are the devaluated coins analogous to the exploitation of African people by the West? So oh, that's, yeah, that's interesting. Uh, I, I kind of equate that or like relate that uh, use of material um, to to the, the the that slavery if he was ref or she was they were referencing that um consider uh the penny when it was made in the 1880s or you know 1800s it was 100 percent copper uh in 1885 it became like 70 percent you know the copper content started depleting and uh the question became that uh if we were to ask why it was when uh, slavery or slave trade was abolished. Um, so now labor became not free anymore. So to compromise uh, value, uh, material became the subject that needed to be compromised. And since then, the copper content has been re reducing just so to match the value of a penny to the mm. penny. Uh, I, find, I find that correlation almost similar to when the need for labor, like I said, uh, humans or people as humans uh, almost were devalued to become objects of mm. trade, tradable objects, uh, in the same way that uh, the penny, which used to be almost valuable, I believe that uh, maybe 100 or 150 years ago, the penny could buy uh, a land. 
And quite uh, ironically, I was told this story that one university was actually uh, uh, built from a penny. So a lady wrote a letter to Ford uh, in, in request for money and he gave them three pennies. Uh, so the lady bought groundnuts or peanuts. It's a story though, uh, I cannot validate this, but she bought peanuts, planted it, and then had a plantation over years. And then out of the plantation, uh, she built a university out of that, or a school out of that. So, you know, you can see the transformation of value through the very little, but now on the streets of New York, there are pennies thrown everywhere, mm. it's worthless. Uh, maybe on the opposite, um, like black lives from West Africa, who were royals, who were collectors, who were intellectuals, uh, when we were captured as slaves, then became almost nothing, you know, stripped naked, and then now become objects of labor or machines mm. working the cotton fields in, in, in West Virginia and all these things. So I have, I, I believe also uh, the fact that. Uh, the penny has that repetition of liberty, uh, the repetition of like and said, and if you are living in the US and you, you consider the lives or how the treatment of black people, even now, then you realize that uh, that symbolism doesn't actually hold its meaning. Mm. Uh, so in, in so many ways, I pick these elements uh, that correspond to the situation of black people. I mean. Imagine in 2020, 2020, uh, we fighting to be seen as human. Mm. And, our lives, and I mean, this is almost uh, uh, an absurd kind of request, you know, from you know people in this day and age to be fighting that. Oh, you know, you should see us as humans. Mm. Um, yeah, I think it's mm. almost about the the, the the relationship of value, and that's why it's causing that, and that's why I use currency. That has to mm, mm, turn it into another form of value. Mm. Well, that's a very interesting metaphor you used. That yeah, I mean, there are very important social issues which can be interpreted through your work and kind of look into it. I mean, here in the UK, we have our own problem in this regards, and the division between people is uh, it's not going any 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 smaller. Uh, thank you very much for that. Uh, there's another question which uh, uh, is asking you if you could be so kind and please talk a little bit about the work hidden behind open walls. What inspired you to do the work? Um, so from, from the summer of 2020, my, my do, you have, do you have a slide, by the way, so we can engage with the audience, or you don't have a slide? No, I that? don't have that. That's fine, that's fine, that's fine, that's fine. But, but then, uh, you know, from, from 2020, when I was ending my, my MFA, uh, you know, we got shut down you know, due to this uh, pandemic and all of that. And then uh, the protests and kind of activism started. Uh, so it started bringing out almost like things that had been suppressed you know, uh, what we were on the streets of the US fighting for, and even globally, what people were, were kind of championing, they, they weren't new things. Uh, to talk about uh, segregation, to talk about kind of racism, it's, it's nothing new. Uh, there's always been uh, uh, these elements that we battle with, not only for black people, but you know, minorities have always been battling with this. And, and I was trying to understand what then, uh, on one hand, has been the hindrance uh, for, for this kind of uh, liberation to happen or even consideration to even be admitted. Uh, and then, and because these are very vivid, I think these are very vivid social issues. And on the other hand, what if we looked at minorities differently? What if we, 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 we built walls or like we wore masks and then your effort is valid by the effort, not by who you are or where you're from. So I was looking at it from these two parts where my work isn't seen as an African art, but it's seen as a purely chemical kind of uh, mm. or political, economical, global object or global kind of conversation. And not because I'm a black man or I'm from Ghana. Uh, 
Uh, mm. So I was thinking about if we stripped away these kind of classisms or these kind of tags, uh, what else, what then do we find? Mm. And that find true humanity, perhaps like uh, true exchanges. Mm. Uh, and and that that piece was quite dear to me because that's when uh, I wish I had the image, but that's when I, I started almost exploding the steel. Mm. Yeah. Mm, very very interesting. Thank you very much for that. Uh, if I may follow up on that, on these uh, on these labels, on these on these categories which you just deconstructed and uh, and challenged, how how comfortable are you being uh, you know represented in uh, uh, African art shows? Uh, is that limiting? Would you do you see yourself as a transnational artist, transglobal artist, as Ghanaian artist, as an artist, as an uh, American artist now? How would you classify yourself, or is it necessary to classify one in one no, of these uh, uh, boxes? Oh, thanks, David. I'm an artist. Yes. I don't have a uh, yes. yes. that I could be a sculptor, I could be a painter, I could be an installation, I could be mm. an activist. Uh, it depends on what I want to kind of respond to. Mm. Of course, I have my own standards and I have my own kind of trajectory mm. and I hold firm to the things that I believe in. Uh, so I, and thankfully, I'm working with a gallery who allows me the freedom to do, to be, yeah. Mm. 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 I mean, when I, 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 I told my galleries that I want to study in New York, there was no hesitation. There was just encouragement for me to go explore. So I've never felt, I mean, working with the gallery, of course, I've never felt that I have to be a Ghanaian or I have to be an African, or now I have to start making things that kind of almost reflect New York, <laughs> <laughs> you know? And, and for that, I showed in, in Dubai, and I think it, it, it allows some sense of consistency in my artistic practice, mm. where I don't have to like change to meet uh, demand. Mm. I've never had mm. that kind of pressure from my gallery, and I love it. That's excellent, that's, that, that's yeah. beautiful. And I know that there is not one uh, formula for that, but yeah. what would you, what would be your advice? How would you advise a uh, uh, young, up and coming artist who would like to make it in the in the art world in the international global art world what would be the advice you would give him or her or they them <laughs> well that would be an advice to me myself <laughs> well you you are already <laughs> in that uh, circulating yeah. into that in the uh, in that category well, i think i think david i i believe in integrity i think mm. uh Art world is so big that everybody will fit in mm. uh, because uh, to some great extent, it's a matter of taste uh, and everybody differs. So I would just encourage myself and whoever wants to be art that, I mean, it's within us really. Um, there's no way I can run out of making. I can make every day. I believe every other artist could also. So if we stick to what you believe in strongly and also keep your curiosity alive, I mean, there is no one way to be making and you can't, I mean, be ambitious, uh, try out things. It might completely not sell. That's completely fine because I, I, I think I've never, I've never made any work because it will sell. Mm. Uh, I've never, and I've never thought of that, about that, but you know, sometimes uh, or even most times, they end up in good places. So it's purely, if I had any advice to myself, be like, yeah, just be yourself. I mean, it's a vague, <laughs> kind of a vague thing, but you no, know, be honest with yourself and know your strength. Right. Yeah, and curious uh, into exploring. That's, absolutely, I think that's a that's brilliant answer. Perhaps we can broaden up that uh, integrity and honesty. It's yeah. the best way in uh, any profession, isn't it? In any life. <laughs> yeah, so that's, I take that advice to myself. Well. <laughs> no, that's great. And in terms of uh, making, uh, uh, looking into material, working, engaging with material, I know that uh, for some time you've been working with coins. You exploring uh, uh, steel. You you know, fascinating with these types of material, how they interact with 
outside forces, perhaps with sun, with the wind, in a, you know, interiors as well. Do you see yourself moving away from materiality of these objects and working with, I don't know, textile, uh, flowers, whatever that might be? Do you have, what's, what's ahead? Do you see any, any material which you feel kind of challenged by and uh, intrigued by? Um, how do I know? I mean, all of these happened by accident. They happened mm. by curiosity. Uh, I think if I, if I know what I'm going to do in my studio, I'll not go to the studio because then, <laughs> uh, if I know specifically the kind of works that I want to be making in 10 years, I'll retire and maybe mm. teach somebody else, uh, how to make them. I don't, I really don't want to know. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I just want to experiment and see how it goes. Uh, and I believe like one work leads to the other, uh, and one project leads to the other. And I love that. I love to be a surprise, like for the work to be a surprise to me as well. Absolutely. I think that's a, that's a very brilliant way how to look at it. Uh, what I see very often, uh, one of the, the issues and, and problems artists face as, you know, as they become more and more successful, then the collectors are expecting pretty much the same work they have already seen because they conform to it, they, they like the work. And all of a sudden when artists comes up with something else what not has been expected, what is brand new, uh, they are a little bit disappointed because they want exactly what they've already seen. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah I have a, a funny story of uh, actually a huge piece that I had made earlier on and uh, there was a, a, a curator who told me, nobody's going to be able to buy this. It's too big. It was 15 by 10 foot. Uh, I think a, a few weeks later, that's when Macau bought it. So, you know, it, it, it then tells me that, you know, I don't know. I don't know what is going to happen to the work. So, you know, you just open yourself up and make it and believe in it. Yeah. Mm, mm. Uh, someone is asking, how do you feel about the bank buying your work? I'm sorry. Uh, uh, how do you feel about a bank, like a financial institution, a bank uh, buying your work? Oh, it's interesting. I think the World Bank has a, <laughs> my work. Uh, yeah, but it's an interesting kind of uh, conversation to have the works that are given out or taken stack on the wall. Um, then <laughs> I, I believe it expands the idea of value in itself. It expands the idea of exchange. Mm. I mean, I'm to know if uh, more banks will, will, but if the World Bank has, uh, then maybe others would also. <laughs> so there are no restrictions in terms of do you not you do not uh, judging on uh, any levels uh, the clients who are buying. No, we we are very we are very careful who the works we we give to. Mm. Like I, I would love uh, for the works to end in spaces that could generate conversations that work can mm -hmm. uh, in certain, certain co uh, collections that work, you know, next to some other makes meaning, you know, of course, you know, imagine my work, as long as I am, you know, having the work with uh, David Hammonds, I mean, that means a lot, you know, mm -hmm. then the work without me being present starts to like tap into the conversation that such artists had already made, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's it's not really about having sold out shows or like selling. It's really about building a career because I'm going to be an artist for life for however long I live. Um, for instance, like in 50 years from now, of course, you know, I can only imagine what my work will be worth uh, if I keep pushing the, these ideas and being honest to myself. Mm. So we, we, I think the gallery paces and if even I sell from the studio, like we pace and we are very aware of who the works are. And, mm. and, and mm. 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 I understand, I understand. And the, yo, may I ask uh, one more thing about the process of, of art making? Let's say if we focus on one individual work, uh, if we can generalize like that, uh, uh, how is the, the last stage, the finishing stage? Do you, is there a moment you know it's done and you can't touch it and you just shove it in a corner and run away? Or do you come back to it and you can't sleep and the next week again and maybe next month? Or how is the, how do you finalize piece of work that you know it's done, it's finished? Um, so my, my work uh, usually doesn't have a starting point. 
Um, because as we speak, I still have uh, coins that I'm treating. Uh, sometimes I discover new textures, I discover new forms, and that could be a starting point for one. I sometimes I identify a date and that could start one, you know, then I start researching and then the stories and, you know, contest comes in. But sometimes, you know, I could either feel that this is done uh, and then, you know, I, I wrap it because it wasn't successful. <laughs> And other times I will feel like it's done. And on my way home, you know, I do U-turns and go back because another idea comes in the middle of the night. Or maybe I'm asleep and I feel like, nah, this, this didn't work. You know, I come to, to take some parts off and feel something. So it's so not an easy process. <laughs> <laughs> not at all. I mean, <laughs> it's a very difficult process to get the coins, I mean, the textures out and it's mm. big, it's big. And so it's, it's very fluid, I must say. Mm, mm. Yeah. so it's a struggle all the way from the beginning to the end <laughs> <laughs> completely, completely struggle brilliant and yeah maybe yes. it's like needed and i'll just snap a picture like okay this is <laughs> <laughs> so there's another question from an audience uh what an extent is your work influenced by el anatsui um uh l l has been a pace setter uh, not for me alone, but for every kind of artist growing in Africa, like West Africa, I could say, because he's Ghanaian, but he lived and taught in Nigeria. Uh, his use of form, I think as an artist, I, I don't know anybody who I could compare in terms of composition to his understanding of color, uh, texture, and even forms, and even objects. I think mm. he's that brilliant that it would be only wise that anybody could learn from him. Mm -hmm. uh, his skill and his ambition is just inspiring. Mm. Uh, of course, I, I, I wouldn't want to learn how he does that. I want to know why he does that. And mm. I learned that. I learned why he's doing that. He's mm. very precious. Uh, and he understands his, his marks, his, his forms, his compositions. And I think for me and maybe a million other artists globally, not only mm -hmm, in Africa, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's, it's only wise you can learn from L. Mm -hmm. Very wise words. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. That's that's brilliant. That's brilliant. Uh, I think we run out of questions from the the audience. Maybe we can. Unless there anything, any closing remarks, any anything that was left unsaid? Uh, well, we pretty much said most. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure maybe if people have questions, I'm always welcome. Like, you're always welcome to ask. Uh, and we have another opportunity. I'm here in London until uh, next Friday. If, if you can't make it on Thursday, next Thursday, which is like... Uh, December 16, uh, you can send an email, I can meet you here, we can walk through together. Uh, and then if you also have an idea that I can learn from, you know, the history that you want to share with me, a book or anything, I'm happy to do that. And I guess uh, finally, is thank you to the audience uh, who joined. Uh, thank you, David, and thank you, SOS. Uh, for organizing this and having me here is a real pleasure, privilege. Well, excellent. Well, thank you so much, uh, first and foremost, to you, you know, for being so kindly, you know, answering all these uh, questions and sharing your work and thought process and your conceptual kind of uh, trajectories as an artist. It's very, very exciting. Uh, fingers crossed that uh, people will be asking uh, generations for us how influenced you were by uh, Yao and so on and so forth. You'll be in a British museum at the entrance to the Sainsbury galleries. Uh, <laughs> I invite everybody again, please come and visit the website of uh, the gallery 1957. Uh, come see the exhibition. It's going to be running for next uh, week or so. And the week from now on the 16th, there is this uh, art talk or walk walk through with uh, Yao, I think it's an amazing opportunity to discuss and share ideas. And as you can see, Yao is open to 
to to ideas and uh, impulses so let's take advantage of it that it will be great i'll be there for sure i'll bring more students from soas uh, thank you very much uh, thank you everybody who participated uh, thank you to center of african studies thank you angelica and uh, hopefully see you soon all right see you all soon excellent thank you, well, thank you so much uh, thank, thank you everybody you. bye bye